Without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to um, um, give the floor to Pieranna Garavasso. Enjoy the presentation. Grazie mille Tiziana per la uh, presentazione. Flattery, uh, molto gentile da parte tua, da parte mia. Uh, volevo ringraziare uh, Tiziana Cervesato e Anna Olivero per avermi ha dato il loro supporto per la creazione di queste presentazioni e per il loro aiuto nel preparare le slides che vedrete. Um, il titolo può sembrare un attimo pessimista, uh, pessimistico. Oh, I'm sorry, I switched to Italian. The title may seem a little pessimistic, but actually it's not because this particular writer that we have chosen had to deal with um, a lot of the hardship. With regard to Aleramo, I think part of the hardship, um, part of the hardship she had to live through were uh, connected with the particular time in which she lived and how, in a way, contrasting her life, her choice and ambitions were with the environment in which she was working. For Natalia Ginsburg, as you can see, of course, her life overlapped the Second World War II, and she certainly um, uh, had several hardships and challenges coming from that particular period. For Dacia Maraini, we have chosen to have her conclude this uh, series of conversation on um, Italian women uh, writers because she's still alive, she's still active, and um, we wanted, as Anna recommended, to um, for, uh, uh, acknowledge the challenges but focus on the legacy. And that's what we are going to do in this um, conversation. So uh, we thought that it was useful to start by reviewing the places of Sibylla Leramo's life. She was born in Alessandria, who is a small little, who is smaller town, let's say, close to Turin, Torino, in the Piedmont region. But then her family moved to first Vercelli and then Milano and then finally to Porto Civitanova Marche. Her father, whose name was Ambrogio Faccio, was an engineer, and um, he always represented in Aleramo's life the side of the sciences and the side of, if you want, success and courage. Um, the mother, who name, whose name was uh, Cotimo, Ernesta Cottino, sorry, um, was actually a very sensitive woman and she transmitted to her children the love for music and for poetry. Um, Sibilla Reramo was born as Rina Faccio and she was the first of four children. Because uh, of her father's work, then they moved to this different um, town and cities. Unfortunately, uh, for uh, Sibilla, when they moved to both Vercelli and then Porto Civita Nova Marche, there wasn't a school for her. And so her education practically ended after the elementary school when she was 12 years old. In uh, 1889, uh, when Sibilla, um, at the time, she was still called Rina, Sibilla Leramo is her pen name. Uh, it's, it's hard to remember to call her Rina, given that she was well known mostly for her pen name. But in 1889, her mother attempted suicide. And that was, of course, a very important event in, um, in our author's life. Um, her mother never totally recovered from this, 
she uh, survived it, but mentally she never totally recovered. And later on, she actually was uh, recovered. She was put in a mental institution. In uh, Porto Civitanova, when they finally moved there, uh, Aleramo was still quite young, probably in her teens. And also because there was no school, they ended, she ended up uh, having a clerical job in the factory in which her father was working, which was a glass factory. I like the idea of looking at the, at the uh, map because um, it's, it gives us an idea of the importance and the contrast between the North and the South. I think this contrast was very important for Aleramo and maybe we, this is a topic that we can talk about in the discussion, but um, it was also very important for the second and the third uh, right that we will discuss in this series, which is uh, Natalia Ginsburg and Dacia Maraini. Okay, Sibylla Leramo then, um, by the scholars and by those who study her, is uh, um, considered still a very, in Italy, a very important writer. And maybe, again, this is a topic on which we can talk a little more. But what's surprising about her is that her production and her, the development of her thinking can be uh, separated in three different periods. The first period in which she wrote this novel, Una Donna, a Woman, that is the work that we will focus on tonight, was the period in which she was writing in a realist fashion. Um, the book is never acknowledged to be a, an autobiography because she doesn't use her name, but it is a clear autobi it's clearly autobiographical. The second period of our production, which is, if you want, the period that corresponds also with the fascist area in Italy, it's a period in which she, um, it's, it's characterized by aestheticism or a, a focus on aesthetics is when she starts developing her work in poetry and she abandons the realist stance. The third period of her life is after the war and after her, um, um, uh, her joining the uh, Communist Party. So um, with this very useful timeline, we can see the major period um, and major uh, dates in her life. Um, we talked about her uh, childhood. 1893 is very important. I wanted to leave the Italian words, il matrimonio riparatore. But what that means is simply that she was, as many women, certainly in the 1800s and before, she ended up marrying the person who actually raped her. And so marriage was seen as a way of repairing the damage done to her honor, maybe to her family's honor by the rape. She was raped by a, an employee of the factory where her uh, dad was working and the page, the page uh, there are many, the page in which she talked about are striking, um, in a sense for the honesty with which she points out that at the time she was so innocent that she almost didn't realize what was happening. After the marriage, she um, had a child, uh, Walter. As you can see, just like her mother, she attempted suicide. There was a very difficult period for her in around 1898, she started writing articles of a feminist nature or 
having to do with the condition of women. They are published on different magazines. She even becomes the director of a woman's magazine. And then finally in 1902, she makes the very uh, strong decision mm -hmm. to leave her husband. Uh, the decision was particularly painful because the laws of the time forced her to leave her son. She couldn't leave with her son, although her husband was uh, violent against her. Um, she continued to uh, write. Um, she wrote 10 books, mostly poetry, uh, after this first book. And she continued writing until the practically the end of her life. Her last book of poetry was published five years before her death. So we thought that it might be interesting to talk a little bit before the last part of my talk, which will be giving voice to her. We will have some quotes from her work, but that might be useful to have a sense of where she was living, not so much the place, sorry, when she was living, what were the times when she, um, she was writing her book. And so I will do a little bit of the history here, not too much, and I'll be happy, as I said before, to expand on this uh, in the discussion, but the 1800 in Italy is really characterized by what we call il risorgimento, that can be translated as resurgence. Italy at that time was still divided in different, um, in different parts of the country that were under different kingdoms. I mean, the Bourbons and the Angioini were uh, dominating in Naples and in southern Italy and in Sicily, while in the north, besides for the kingdom of Piedmont, um, there was the, um, the Austro-Hungarian uh, domination of the Venetian area. So Italy wasn't unified. The unification of Italy, the major figures were Camillo Benso Conte di Cavour, who was the minister for Vittorio Emanuele II, who was the king of the um, kingdom of Piedmont, uh, Garibaldi, Giuseppe Garibaldi. I know many of you love Italy and travel there. I doubt there is one city in Italy that doesn't have a bridge, a square, or a corso devoted to Garibaldi. Giuseppe Garibaldi was the general who led 1,000 red shirt, the Camice Rosse, nella spedizione dei mille, so the raid of the 1,000, who went down to Sicily and uh, practically um, sent uh, out the kings that were there and uh, reconquered all that part of Italy. And they also entered into Rome. You can imagine how controversial that was with the Pope uh, there, but that allowed Rome to become the capital of Italy in, 1870. Now, why do I think this history is important? Well, I think it is because if you think that Sibylla Leramo was born in 1876, you realize that she was born six years after Rome had become the capital of Italy and only 16 years after Italy had become a unified um, country and nation. So those were times of great change. Um, how was the situation of Italy at that time? Well, things were not easy, right? The literacy were, was very, very high. You can see some of the uh, numbers there and um, changes didn't come very quickly. I mean, practically, 50 years after unification, you still have 33% of male Italians who couldn't read and 42% of women. 
uh, industries, uh, roads were difficult, but I would like us to focus a little bit on the, the, the situation of women. Um, women were not educated like men. Um, uh, only in, with the Lex Casati, elementary education was uh, uh, mandatory. Women were, were often encouraged uh, to take um, uh, jobs where they would teach at the lower level. And when the reform of Gentile, which happened, Giovanni Gentile was a philosopher, an idealist philosophy, but he also became Minister of Education uh, under Mussolini, and he uh, developed this uh, change in the school system, which lasted for a long time, and which um, um, emphasized the importance of the humanities. It was way too late, of course, for Sibylla Alerano. Um, for girls in elementary school, it was compulsory to do needle work. And that gives you an idea, not for boys, of course, but uh, for girls. So let's focus a little more on the condition of women in the period in which Sibylla Aleramo uh, was born and grew up. I like this quote. Anna Maria Mazzoni was a, um, uh, Mozzoni was an activist and a, and a feminist. And, and this allows me to make a, just a small parenthesis. Sibylla Aleramo, as we say in the presentation of today's conversation, is often, in Italy, still often considered one of the first feminists, if not the first Italian feminist. Now, she wasn't. There were a lot of other women who were feminists and activists. The problem is that their work has not been maintained, has not been reprinted. Ale Ramos' work, thank goodness, has been maintained. And so I think that really plays an important role on why she's still very famous. As you can see there, women did not have any voting rights. Actually, men, um, there was the universal suffrage in Italy in 1912, so for all male. For women, only in 1946, uh, which is not very early, but women at least were able to vote for the birth of the Republic because that was when the monarchy was abolished. In marriage, in marriage they had no, um, how do I want to say, tutelage or rights. For example, Ale Ramo will receive an inheritance from one of her relatives, but she wasn't able to keep it. And so um, when she separated from her husband, her property stayed with her husband. And some of the most cruel, of, co of course, uh, laws were uh, such that she couldn't take her child. She couldn't have custody of it her child. After she separated from her husband, she did fight trying legally to try to obtain uh, the custody of her son, but she was never able to do that. I, the, the weight of the church and of the uh, religious education was still very powerful. I want to just read to you something that we changed so Gioberti, who was a philosopher and politician, says uh, about women, in some sense, woman is for men like what the vegetable is for the animal or the parasite plant towards the plant that stand and supports itself. So this was part of the background in which she was working. And the situation for women who decided or wanted to be writers was even worse. This is a quote from Benedetto Croce, who was another important philosopher, idealist, very important in the fascist area. He was very important for his theory, aesthetical 
theory. As you can see, it says women just, they can generate children, but they cannot generate art or thought or philosophy. If they do, they must be exception. So here I want to tell you a very cute anecdote that I found when I was working on this conversation. So Grazia de Leda was a very important writer and she was one of the ones on which I was thinking of giving a presentation but then I decided for Aleramo. Grazia de Leda um, received um, a Nobel Prize for Literature in 1926. She was the second woman to receive it. The first one was uh, Selma Lager Love in 1909. But anyway, because she was so active in writing, Grazia de Leda was told that maybe that wasn't a very good idea to focus so much on her writing because she would not be able to find a husband. And so in an interview, she said, well, I just wanted to tell you that you don't have to worry about that because my, the first money I got from my writing, I bought a beautiful silk uh, scarf and that soon won me her first declaration of love. So I thought it would be good to tell you that they knew how to defend themselves. Um, it was contrasted too, because not all women thought that women should or could be writers. For example, a very famous, uh, well-known writer of that period, her name was Neera. She writes, that it's far better to be the humble mother of Dante on Leonardo than to be George Sand <clears throat> or George Eliot. And that a mediocre marriage is far better than the glamorous career. So this is the environment, uh, cultural environment, in, the, in which Sibylla Leramo publishes her book, Una Donna. Um, it was, it's interesting to, and again, we can talk more about this, but this book was initially rejected by another publisher, and it was rejected because it was too boring. And part of it, it seems to me, if we talk about why, I mean, if you read the book, you realize that it's hard to call it boring, but it seems to me the analogy that I make is that it was boring because it had to do with the domestic story, a story of a domestic space in which a woman was living. And maybe readers were not used at the time um, to read stories about a, a, an environment so domestic. Uh, these are the frontispiece of two editions, the first printing and the 60th printing that was in 2019. Um, the Guardian uh, in, uh, I think it was March 2020, uh, devoted an article to Sibylla Leramo's book, not of course in the Italian version, but in the latest translation, which, as you can see, was published exactly this year. I'll say just a few words about this translation. The first one was characterized as lengthy and literal. The second one was um, praised by many, for example, uh, somebody said uh, the elegance of Rosalind Delmar's version imparts a freshness and vigor to the text, which uh, might have been dissipated as she followed too slavishly the text. So Delmar was, Delmar was trying to correct the problems in the literal translation by Mary Lansley, but this translation was criticized as being too political. So I have Valerio Ferme saying that this politiz politicization of the text 
would seem unwarranted. So it was criticized. The last translation, maybe I'll talk about it a little bit later when we look at the quote. So why was she so controversial? I had three suggestions. And uh, sorry, uh, I didn't want to say why was she so controversial. Why was she or why was her book so successful? I mean, why all this interest? Well, first of all, uh, and it was because of the controversy of her life. She had abandoned her son. I mean, that was really something unusual and certainly not considered um, worthy for a woman. Two, she had, and that's true in her life, uh, a lot of love affairs with a lot of different men and very famous men. And so there was an aura of scandal to her life. Um, but the third element is that in the book, she is incredibly honest. I mean, she talks about marriage or rape. She talks about domestic violence. She talks about sexually transmitted diseases because her husband, uh, who was unfaithful, does uh, become uh, uh, ill. And some of the, uh, the comments on her book um, uh, by other women point out that she should have been supportive for this poor, sick, ill man. And that clearly, is something that nowadays we would think to be very strange. Um, and so I think those were some of the reasons she, um, she became so famous. I decided, uh, the last part of this conversation is a part in which we want to give you her own words. So I've selected some quotes and in most of the cases, I give you the English translation and the Italian. And in some cases, I will read the Italian because I think it's, it's very powerful. These are the major, um, I think we are doing fine with time. Um, okay. Uh, these are the major topics that I chose as topics to focus on. So uh, let us start with the very uh, sad topic of race. Now, in this case, I told you I was going to talk a little bit about the translation because it's really interesting, right? In Italian, we say traduttore traditore. So translator, betrayer. And that's very um, uncharitable toward translators. I was a translator before coming to this country. And I know how beautiful it is to do the work and how difficult. But it is true that the translator is going to do interpretive work. It's inevitable. And the interpretive work is what can make the work even more interesting and uh, you know faceted but at the same time may not necessarily interpret it exactly uh, like the author intended it so here is the original after the rape she asks herself appartenevo ad un uomo dunque lo credetti dopo non so quanti giorni di uno smarrimento senza nome What's interesting here is she's asking herself, do I belong to a man now? And her word is, do I belong to a man? Really, if you read the text in the context in particular, it's hard for me to think that she was wondering whether she belonged to this man. She is in a sense, outraged to belong to a man, <laughs> any man. <laughs> and that's not in the either one of the translation. The two translations in English sound very right or very good, but they do, um, they, they put it, 
there is an overlapping interpretation in a sense. And so I wanted just to tell you that. There is also that interesting change of subject, right, in the two translations. Because in the first one, I said, did this man now own me? And the focus is on the man who owns her. But the other one is, did I belong to a man now? Where she is reclaiming her subjectivity. And so I think they, they are very interesting differences. Okay, this one I will not read because it's very long, but I'll give you one minute if Tiziana doesn't scold me to read it. So I let you, I let you read it. What I particularly like in this passage, I mean, there is so much we could spend time on, clearly the issue of the woman being a piece of property, which she felt very strongly, in particular, with the repeated marital rape that she was subjected to. But I think what she's saying here is women need to be educated. How can she, a woman be a companion, a partner, the spouse, the wife, the mother of his children to a man if she is left with no education, no um, possibility of realizing herself. And I think that is one of the most um, forward looking points of their work. Okay, I want to read this to you because it's a very interesting uh, quote. Perché nella maternità adoriamo il sacrificio? Donde è scesa a noi questa inumana idea dell'immolazione materna? Di madre in figlia, da secoli, si tramanda il servaggio. È una mostruosa catena. In, in Italian, it is a very powerful, I mean, there is monstrous, the word, the chain from mother to daughter is a monstrous chain. And there is the word servaggio as servitude or slavery. So the idea is, why do we think mother should self-sacrifice? And this is a theme that continues in this other quote, which is, to me almost um, humorous because I think in particular in America, in this country, there is this stereotype of the Italian mother. I'm an Italian mother, so I'm not a hundred percent happy about this stereotype, but there is this whole idea that Italian men venerate their mother, but then mistreat any other woman in their life or exploit uh, any other woman in their life. So this seemed to have been in, uh, in the culture, if you want, already uh, more than a century ago. And then uh, this other quote is a very nice quote in which she points out that uh, we should give to our children the best of us. And in order to do that, we need to realize ourselves as human, we can just not do that. And this, on the contrary, is not what happens when mothers um, sacrifice themselves, give up, as the translation says, uh, being ourselves. We are approaching the last quotes. These are quotes not from the book, A Woman, but quotes from her diaries in the last years of her life. And I wanna let you read them and then point out two themes.
So the first two quotes are actually from her diary. The last one is a critic or a scholar. Um, but the themes of her being a free lover, a very controversial and daring figure is clearly there. The second quote to me is very special because signifies um, one of their dogmas. I mean, for her, it was very important to understand that literature and life were the same. Um, her slogan at the time was Amo dunque sono, uh, which is clearly in analogy to René Descartes, the uh, French philosopher who did the cogito ergo sum, right? I think, therefore I am. And she created her own slogan, I love, therefore I am. So it was like saying that the substance of her life was love. And so these love affairs were not something superficial and frivolous, but it was her own life. Um, okay, um, Sibylla Leramo believed very strongly that uh, she wanted to be a poet. So in a sense, she wanted not her autobiography, but her poetry to be remembered. And so I thought it was good to finish with giving you one of her poems, which I will now read. Per tutta la vita, volli dei miei giorni far cosa di luce, cosa d'amore, ed essi posi avanti ogni mia arte, ed essi feci poesia perenne. O giorni, tra scoloranti riviere, giorni miei duri diamanti. Um, she is still considered very important in Italy. Why? It's something we can talk more about. Um, I think uh, it's important because of her, in a sense, controversial life to remember what she says here which she was not seeking fame or notoriety, but she wanted to be listened to. I, I particularly like that last word sentence where she said, io don, non domando fama, domando ascolto. She was aware that maybe her poetry after all wasn't as good as she thought it was, but she certainly wanted to be heard. She wanted her voice to be heard. Um, I, I just want to mention there was a conference organized in 2007 in Italy at a university to celebrate 100 years from the publication of Una Donna. So, and I, I had the website and you can see there were a lot of scholars. In Italy, she is still a name uh, of somebody who has left a very important legacy. So thank you for your attention. I hope you have questions. I had mentioned different texts that I used in preparing this conversation. I will be very happy to provide a bibliography if you want to read more. You'll be surprised to see that there are a whole dissertations in English. Um, on Sibilla Aleramo. So thank you very much. Grazie Pirana, grazie tanto. So we'll um, <clears throat> go ahead with the, the Q&A. So um, if you have a question, feel free to write it in the chat or just you can just unmute yourselves and ask your question to Pirana. Um, so this is Mary Capozzi. Yes. And uh, thank you so much. The presentation was, was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I had the opportunity in the early 90s, from 91 to 95, to live in Milano and, and uh, work. And at the time, uh, I was in my early 30s. 
I came to an office of a company that does engineering with the, the, um, it, the company is called Honeywell and mm -hmm. it was headquartered here in Minneapolis. And, and so they sent me to work uh, in Milano, I think because my last name is Capozzi and my father was, was born in, in Naples. Um, but uh, it was striking to me at the time, the difference between my experience of going to university and the opportunities that I had coming out of university here uh, in the US, uh, opposed to my female colleagues, most of whom were secretaries, um, and just the general difference of the role of women uh, in Italy at the time. Obviously, I think things have changed somewhat since then, uh, because I go back often because I made very good friends there. So I hear from them and spend a lot of time. But would you say that things have changed a lot in Italy in the 50 years, um, in the last 50 years or so? Or do you feel that there's still this attachment to la mamma and the role of la mamma in the, in the family and everything that is emoted or, or intended by that phrase? Yeah, thank you. It's a wonderful question. And um, I think in Italy, as far you know, I, I share your experience. When I go back, uh, now that I lived, uh, you know, since um, 18, nine, sorry, 1980 here, I'm so surprised by how different it, it is there and how differently my colleagues are treated, my colleague, women colleagues. Here I'm used to the fact that at least for maybe politeness, my colleagues or male colleagues will respect, you know, what I say or let me talk or, and, and it's funny for me to go back and see how that is not the case there. But of course I'm free to come back and so I don't feel affected by it, but it's very sad. I just tell you, in philosophy, a, a beautiful book was published called Singing in the Fire. There are essays by, Itali by American women philosophers who talk about their experiences. They're Australian, they're American, they're British. I wanted to do the same thing for my Italian colleagues. I want to, I offer my service to edit this book. Nobody, these were full professors, women who had a full career. They didn't want to talk about it. They were still feeling vulnerable. So mm. uh, yes, I agree with you. Things are not as the same. The law has changed a little bit. I don't want to make it political, but I have to say the 20 years of Berlusconi did not help because women were not respected by the prime minister and that allowed a lot of people to feel like they could talk about women in the way in which he did. So there was a backlash, I believe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, that was... Very interesting to me. <laughs> That's a Mary. Anyone else who would like to? Oh, I see we have two chat. questions in the chat. Yeah, one from Bruna. Bruna, would you like to unmute and ask your question or? I can read it for you otherwise. <clears throat> okay. Yes. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I was just curious. Um, how was uh, how was she received by her son? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, so she tried, as I said, to fight to get custody. And she does say in the book that she was writing the book so that he would know what led to her abandoning him. The only... She made an attempt when he was a teenager 
to reach out and he didn't want to talk with her. There was a meeting between the two of them 30 years later. And I think it was, uh, how do I say, a mild meeting in the sense that the son was moderately positive, but it never led to anything. So she did lose her son. If you allow me a minute on this, because for me too, that has been one of the most difficult um, points to uh, accept. Also because she was leaving, when she left, she didn't know she wouldn't have custody. But she, so she might have been a hoping still to happen. But because her husband was violent against her, you wonder how could she leave at seven years old. On the other side, the husband was never violent toward the, the son. But um, if you read the book, it seems to me that appear clearly that she had two options, and one of which she had already tried. One was to kill herself because she didn't feel like she could live this way. I mean, she was raped, she was used, she was, um, you know, I, I, he locks her in after her suicide attempt. He will lock her in. Um, so either she had killing herself or leaving, and in both ways, she would have lost her son. And so it seemed to me that's what made it, um, in quote, acceptable, with the hope of having custody. But it's a very tough point. Thank you, Bruna. Grazie, Bruna. We have Elizabeth who has a question as well. Elizabeth, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Um, hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes okay, perfect. hello. <laughs> Just no. a quick question. Um, I, I translate um, Italian fiction and I am um, wondering, I'm not, I didn't see, just a quick look, I didn't really see her uh, other work translated. Do you, if, if um, something were to be translated, another work of hers, would, would there be one in particular that you might recommend prose though? Hmm. I go to the list. I have a list of all the other works that she wrote, as I said, 10 books. And um, the, well, there was, I, personally, to tell you the truth, because I enjoy them, I think a diaries would be I was wondering very, if that might be, yeah. Yes, yeah, as soon as you showed the excerpt. Very interesting. Uh, I'm not good with poetry. I'm yeah. sure that could be. I, I'm, I've been reading her novel, uh, Amo Dunque Sono, Mm -hmm. which is uh, a, a, it's a, a, they are mostly letters. She loved to do novels um, that were made with letters because another one of her book, which is Un Viaggio Chiamato Amore, it's a whole collection of letters between her and Campana, Dino Campana. Mm -hmm. a, a poet she was uh, in love with for that period, for those four years. So um, either there's two books of letters or the diaries would be my okay. suggestion. Okay, oh, well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. And then we have a third question in the chat. Uh, Jolie, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure, thank you. Um, I was really struck by the quote where she wonders where, whether or how a good mother who does all the right things, who self-sacrifices, could still produce sons who mistreat women. And I wonder if she sort of made the leap to considering whether it might be that self-sacrifice that leads them to mistreat women and whether she thought of herself perhaps as a model uh, for other women to, you know, um, perhaps do a little less 
self-sacrificing and maybe uh, raise better sons. Yes, yes. Um, absolutely. I mean, she does say in the book that she is writing the book for her son so that he knows what, um, you know, her life was and how difficult the choice was to uh, abandon him. But she also mentioned the fact that she hopes the other will follow. And you are right, the critic, she makes a very clear connection between that self-sacrifice, you know, and, and uh, abnegation and not becoming a full individual, well-developed individual, and allowing these people not to respect you. Um, I think one of the reasons, the question, the puzzle that I always have is, why do people still read to her? Is because she, the book has such a power of authenticity. You can really see that it's written by a person who didn't have it easy, but who was able to self-realize. I mean, of course, she had to cut parts of herself, like abandon a child, but she did realize herself. She did become a poet she did uh, publish. And so I think she made that very clear connection between being a fully developed human being and being able to be a better mother. By the way, she did think that men and women are different and that they, you know, gender makes them different. But she did write about them having to be complementary and supporting of each other. She didn't believe like Mussolini that men and women are different and men are superior. She, of course, never accepted that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Julie, for your question. Um, anyone else who would like to ask a, a question? I had a quick question. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> Oh. So you mentioned Sibylla was one of the first feminists in Italy. Um, how does that compare to the countries around or, or the world around her at that time? Was Italy oh, kind of at yes. the edge? Or? Yes. Well, in one of my slides, and I couldn't go over it because it was too much, but I talk about Simone de Beauvoir. So Simone de Beauvoir in France publishes The Second Sex, in uh, uh, 1949, and in that she has elaborate, she was the, uh, the partner of Sartre, who was an existentialist philosopher, and she was a well-famous feminist. So Simone de Beauvoir doesn't come out of nothing. There was, there was a lot of feminist writing in France. There was in Italy too, as I said. So, for example, one of the figures that was important to her was Anna Kulishov. Um, but Anna Kulishov is barely known in Italy. She was the companion and partner of a socialist um, activist whose name was Filippo Turati. And they will both appear in uh, Natalia Ginsburg's work as activist uh, political figures. So there were figures uh, in Italy as well that had an influence on her. As I said before, their work though has not been maintained. I had to confess that I'm not um, as an expert as I would like to be, for example, for the feminist in Spain, or who might have been in Germany at the time. Um, I think she didn't travel, she didn't have a lot of possibilities, but Maria Montessori, for example, she had a connection with her, and she is well known in America for her educational theories. So that would have been a person who also had an influence on her. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Stefan. All right. Maybe we can take one last question. And if no one has a question, I actually have a question for you, Piranha. Hey, Rita. <laughs> no, I, I think it would be interesting to to um, to learn how you did first hear about Sibila Aleramo and is she, um, I mean, are her writings part of the standard curriculum in, in Italian schools or? I wish. <laughs> actually, actually, Natalia Ginsburg will find out that one of her short essay is now almost always required in, you know, high school or middle school and, and so on. But Sibylla Aleramo, uh, in a sense, she was a mystery for me too when I first found out about her in Italy. When I became interested in feminist philosophy and feminist theory, I wondered about, you know, what about Italians? Uh, there must have been some Italian women writing. And I think she is one of the few whose work is actually, as you had seen, uh, reprinted and so available. And so the reason why I um, found out about her is because of my interest, my career work in philosophy and my interest in feminist philosophy. I have to say, in Italy, <clears throat> feminism exists in uh, uh, political activism, but not so much in the academic world. And so it was always only because I was active with other groups of women before I moved to the United States that I found out about this writing not through school or an academic career. It was because of political activism. And that's sort of interesting, but unfortunately, no, uh, I don't think it's read in the school. We'll it's have just, to do something about it. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. agree. I hope more translations are made. Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Thank All you. All right. Well, uh, it looks like we have covered all the questions. So um, again, I would like to thank you, uh, Pieranna. Grazie mille. Um, and thank you for everyone who joined us tonight. And I hope that you can uh, join us for the next uh, appointment, which is on November 12. And Pieranna will present uh, Natalia Ginsburg uh, that day. So. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank you have a great evening and see you soon. A presto. Ciao. Ciao. Grazie. Grazie.